Hello, my name is Dr. Jim Doty, and I'm the host of the Into the Magic Shop podcast, where we explore the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart. Hi, this is Dr. Jim Doty, host of the Into the Magic Shop podcast. Today, my guest is David Acker, who is an organizational theorist, consultant, and professor emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley's Haas School of Business. He's a specialist in marketing with a focus on brand strategy. He serves as vice chairman of the San Francisco-based growth consulting company, Profit. He has won numerous awards for his work in the science of marketing, including the Paul D. Converse Award, the B.J. Mahajan Award, and the Buck Weaver Award. He was inducted into the American Marketing Association's Hall of Fame in 2015. He is also the creator of the Acker Model, which views brand equity as a combination of brand awareness, brand loyalty, and brand associations. Today, we're going to discuss the intersection of brand awareness, brand loyalty, and compassion. Thank you for being with me today. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Well, it's great to uh, have you with me today. Uh, you know, it's uh, obviously I know Jennifer, your daughter, and uh, she was kind enough to uh, be on the podcast a bit ago, but uh, I really appreciate you uh, spending time with me today. Uh, as you know, people have called you the father of modern branding, uh, You've offer, uh, authored, uh, what, over 18 books, uh, 100 articles on branding and uh, business strategy. But, you know, I think the important thing for our conversation today is this um, book called The Future of uh, Purpose-Driven Branding. And uh, as you know, from my own background, obviously, uh, I look at the world through the lens of uh, compassion and service. And in some ways, this uh, new book of yours, I think, intersects that in the sense of uh, defining purpose, but from a, if you will, a corporate perspective, and how uh, do you create, create purpose for employees? Is that a correct statement? Well, yes. It, um, in my focus is on uh, the enterprise and uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, that. It, it really needs to have a purpose. That's a very uh, prominent kind of discussion in today's strategy circles. And companies want to have a purpose. And of course, you can have a purpose to increase sales, and that's not very ennobling. You can even have a purpose create insanely great products like Steve Jobs used to do. But uh, th that uh, that gets you partway there. But my, uh, my assertion is that uh, really that doesn't do the job because that's still oriented toward commercial success. And what you really need is a social purpose. And that could be something b uh, baked into the business purpose or it can be a standalone social purpose. But in any case, it, it's, it, it really has to send signals, especially internally, that it's okay to develop social programs. It's uh, um, it's okay to invest in them and to, uh, uh, you know, to take a long-term strategic view from them. It's just okay. So that and the culture and the values set the stage. But then where I think we start to interact is that the, there's a lot of motivations for that. There, you know, the, the world needs help. Uh, businessmen have resources and agility. They can help, so they should help. But, um, the uh, uh, a major motivation is employees demand it. Employees want it, um, meaning in their professional life, and uh, they and especially younger employees. Uh, there is a, a a substantial subset of younger cohort that will not work for a company that's sort of just in it for the shareholders. They really uh, want that dimension in their professional life. So as I uh, suggested to you is that uh, th there's really a uh, interesting 
a juxtaposition between your meeting in your personal life, which I think you seem to uh, uh, focus on, as does almost everybody that's talking about meaning. And uh, and 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 I wonder if the field doesn't neglect a little bit the meaning in your your professional life and and how that inner in, you know overlaps or or interacts with your meaning in your personal life. I think that the the response of the business community to social problems, including climate change, has been just just astounding. And it's really based on sincerity and authenticity in almost every case. But there's a there's a complication. There's a consensus now that a social program should uh, positively impact the business. The business should get value from it, and they shouldn't. It shouldn't just be a standalone altruistic uh, thing that makes you feel good. But it should uh, it should actually help the business, and. Uh, and the way it, in, in my book, I explain the best way for it to help the business is, uh, is by uh, improving the business brand, giving the business brand an energy and visibility lift, giving it an image and emotional feeling lift, and giving, uh, uh, giving it opportunities to engage stakeholders. And an engaged person is more, uh, you know, has a higher affinity for something, and that's all good for the business. So, w- when you um, you put that on the table, then then the uh, the complication you mentioned is even more severe. So, if the business is going to not only, I mean, they're, they're, that's their goal is to benefit from the social program. That's one of the goals. It's a second goal, but it's still a goal. And so, so then you you get uh, really even more vulnerable to the uh, to the accusation. This is self serving. This is just tokenism. You're not really trying to do anything. You just want something to talk about. Or w- there's a phrase called greenwashing in the climate change area. You're just uh, you know talking about environmental things, and it's all a mirage. It, it's even um, deceptive. And uh, so, so the, what that means is it's it's. I mean, the whole thing doesn't work unless your the organization is really sincere, unless it has passion, unless it's actually gotten the weeds and is a thought leader or at least a thought understander about the complexities of the problem and the and the and you know the. Uh, desire to do something. If they're using a nonprofit as a strategic partner, they should, um, it, you know, have researched and made sure this was this is somebody that's a good one. They should get involved in that nonprofit, and and help it do its thing and help him uh, be on the right course and so on. So uh, it the the program has to have authenticity behind it. It, and that's that come back now to the 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 value of a social purpose and and a company's culture and values. So if you have an organization I- at the top, then uh, I mean you have you have sort of two guards against that phenomenon. One, you have the organization that's at the top with its uh, top executive team ha- developed a social purpose that they talk about and believe in. That they uh, and then they have a culture and values that support that, and then at at the second level you have a, 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 what I call signature social programs, branded signature programs that really are impactful and really communicate and uh, and are long term. They represent commitment of decades, not months, and uh, and so if you have those two things in place. You are going to have authenticity. You are going to have passion, and you're you're not going to have people say this is phony, this is selling, this is self-serving, this is tokenism. Obviously, uh, people spend a great deal of time at work, and if they can be in an environment where uh, it speaks to their own personal values, or creates programs, social programs that uh, resonate with them, then uh, actually. You can't pay an employee enough uh, for the amount of extra work they'll do in those environments, and it also actually, uh, conversely, affects uh, uh, 
uh, health care costs because they're diminished, because you alleviate a lot of stress and anxiety uh, through these types of programs if they're combined with uh, empathy and compassion. And also, uh, you decrease uh, human resource costs as well. So uh, is your recommendation then basically for any uh, corporation at this point in time that they must have these type of programs if they're going to be successful because the good employees or this latest generation of employees demand it? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really nice uh, description. That's helpful to me. Uh, I, I, it, it, I think it's really helpful to see some examples. Let me quickly give you one or two. Um, a Dove in uh, 2003 found their growth had, had tapered off. The moisturizer thing wasn't working for shampoos and so on. And they, somebody there got an insight that uh, women were really held to an artificial standard of beauty. And they did a survey of 3,000 women in 10 countries and they only two or three percent thought they were beautiful, and uh, so they started a campaign called Real Beauty, and it's now been going on for almost two decades, and uh, and they've done almost every year they do a major a study or something that uh, um, that sort of gives it another perspective, gives it a little energy. One time they had an artist. Uh, draw a woman based on her self-description and then draw it based on the description of some stranger. And the one with the stranger was much more attractive than the one, the thing. And they, they said, you know, you're more beautiful than you think you are. And, and uh, that thing got uh, a millions of, of, of views, uh, maybe a hundred million views. And, uh, and, and that's just one of a dozen such programs they've had over the years. And uh, and there's no question they have influenced the perceptions and the self confidence and the self esteem of hundreds of millions of women and, and teenage girls. It's been an enormous a success in terms of its social impact, but also uh, Dove has increased its business from 2.4 billion to over 4 billion during that same time frame, and so it's it's really helped Dove. In fact. I mean, it is the Dove business strategy. I mean, they don't run ads talking about soap. And, uh, and it's created a, 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 quite an affinity. It's created enormous visibility and energy for their brand. And so it's been a, a, a win-win. But there's nobody that claims Dove is self-serving or is engaged in tokenism or anything because the passion toward that thing and the extent that they understand what's involved. They develop the self-esteem for teen girls. They've got all kinds of, of uh, teaching aids and discussion aids and retreat aids for that. And, and uh, that's, you know, that's, it, it just doesn't come up being self-serving. And if you look at Goldman, uh, Goldman Sachs, which has got kind of a reputation as, a, as a, an aggressive uh, shareholder-driven uh, uh Let's let's make money. Kind of organization they started in 2008, 10,000 women, where they uh, ed, they took on the task of providing business education and access to financing for entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs in the developing countries. And after 10 years, they achieved their goal and they doubled the goal, and they're going to go on, and in the second decade, and and this has had an enormous effect on the GMP and the employment rate, and to say nothing of the status of women in all these countries. It's done a, a terrific thing, and uh, it really uh, provides an alternative uh, picture of your company if you're an employee a Goldman. It, and, and if you're at a cocktail party, say, what do you do? And he said, well, uh, let me talk about 10,000 women. That's, that's who we are. Uh, we, can, we can package that uh, aggressive can-do competent, um, you know, team-oriented uh, way of operating, and we can, we can do a heck of a lot of good with that. And since then, they've got 10,000 small businesses and a million black women, and, and they've ex extended that program. So, I mean, if you just look at those two programs, the Dove Real Beauty and the Goldman 10,000 Women, 
you 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 get a feel of what it's like to have a branded program that's that's really effective, has passion and commitment and, and behind it. And I I say um, the point of my book is two things. One is you need a branded program. And most, most companies have a, 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 a system of giving away small grants. They have a volunteer program. They have energy goals. They might fill out the ESG questionnaire. And none of that really uh, gets you there. None of that gives you a company that you're proud of. None of that really uh, um, may has, has as much impact as it should, giving the resources that, uh, expended. And so what you need is a branded program. And my second point is that you want to have this branded program elevate the business brand and therefore the business. Because if you do that, the business will, will have, have an easier time justifying building up this social program even more and, and committing to it over time with resources, with endorsements and... Uh, with access to their communication budget, access to um, a, a lot of the things they do well, and so it, it's just a, a you know it's a flywheel. It just a you know the, the 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 signature program improves the business. That business therefore is more uh, it, for a lot of reasons. Not only because it helps their business, but they then help the social program because they know more about it. And they're and they're perhaps even integrated into it. It's integrated into their business strategy, like it is in the case of Dove, and uh, and so so the the two brands that I think need to be focused on is the is the, is the signature program brand and the business brand, and 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 that's really the key to success. And that's not used as much as it should be. Let me ask you a question. I, I mean, for a period of time, it was very popular to promote CSR, uh, uh, corporate social responsibility. My own limited interaction in that space, though, is that oftentimes it did not come authentically from the entity, but and you could call it greenwashing or in some ways uh, trying to appease people but it, there was no commitment behind it for many corporate entities. Would you agree with that? Um, I, I think that uh, the, that corporate social responsibility is a good thing, and it's really sort of uh, the the almost not well. It's a little strong to say it's the birth of this whole movement, but it's done a lot of good. But uh, you know, it started in the fifties or sixties, and uh, and by the 80s and 90s, it's a little tired, and uh, it didn't have. It was it was kind of viewed as philanthropy. It's a views as we got the resources, we should give a little bit of it to to people in need, and uh, it wasn't tied in 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 it, almost never to the business strategy, so it was didn't have that link, and uh, it wasn't usually managed professionally like they would manage a business it's it wasn't a brand there was no there's very few branded signature programs out there it was more just uh you know basic basically uh, have programs to help the uh, individual employee you know have a few days off or or something to do some good and and uh, again a system of grants so um it it it, I, I would call it is the uh, sort of the early stages of where we are now. It's sort of our heritage, but we we uh, I think that what's what's working now and what's behind the excitement behind all the effort that firms are putting on is uh, you know is is uh, is it represents taking a step beyond and above see uh, consumer. Uh, or corporate social responsibility. Well, let me ask you uh, another question. It's interesting because in some ways the consumer has to have an affiliation or connection to the brand, right? In some ways that's what you're talking about. You're, yes. you're creating a program that is, oftentimes is very moving to the consumer uh, and this in some ways uh, comes uh, with the requirement that there is a trust of that brand. 
Uh, how important is this sort of connection between believing a brand is quote unquote trustworthy? It's uh, well, we we there is a, a quasi experiment that was done that's uh, very telling. Um, Barclays in two thousand and in nine with the financial debacle was was blamed by many for it, or at least uh, as one of the causes because of their the way they handle LIBOR, which is an interest rate uh, phenomenon that's important to the workings of the financial community. And so at, at in around 2010, they were the least trusted brand in the least trusted industry in all of UK. And so they tried everything. They did ran ads, said, you know, we're not as bad as you think, and besides, we're changed. And uh, it just didn't work. I mean, it was flatline. The trust was in that it was it was as bad as it could get, and then they <laughs> created a whole new social purpose, which involved uh, you know letting everybody uh, you know uh, dance to their potential or something like that, and they and they took their employee base and they say you know go out in the world and and uh, and implement this new social purpose. And the employees did that. They got about 40 programs that an employee uh, generated. One of them was called Digital Eagles. And that was a program to help people thrive in the digital age, especially older people, especially kids. And they did tea and teach in their thing where you go and have tea and learn. They had online learning and they made house calls. They uh, uh, did a bunch of things. They started out with 17 employees in this program. Today, there's 17,000 of Barclays employees are involved. But then, then they, they started to, to uh, uh, culture stories around the, this program and others. And they put the stories into three-minute videos that were very emotional. Um, one was about a, a man that was involved in walking soccer because he injured his uh, leg. He was older. He couldn't play real soccer anymore. And... Uh, so they ran these ads, and in in uh, in less than a year's time, trust went up dramatically. Trump was trust went up, you know, thirty three, thirty five uh, 5 percent. Consideration went up uh, that much, and these numbers were five times what they were getting with just normal. Let me explain to you why we're better kind of thing, and uh, and and then they got. Um, uh, uh, 5,000 pre positive press mentions. And this was a company that was buried with negative press before that. So, but, but to your point, one of the dependent variables that they monitor was trust. And that, and that was a motivation for this whole thing. And trust was dramatically changed by the visibility of stories around uh, the social program, Digital Eagles. Maybe this could be a program that Wells Fargo might embrace since they've had a, a lot of uh, challenges uh, with gaining trust by repeated episodes of uh, violating that trust. Well, and more generally, my advice to people that are in problems like that is to, uh, is, is it, I, my advice is arguing back is not, you might have to do a little bit of that, but that's not going to get you there. You have to change the conversation. And I would definitely advise Wells Fargo to change the conversation, provide other things to talk about, except for uh, for their, you know, their misdeeds. Failings, and, yes. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, Walmart. You know, it was a company you hate, you love to hate because of how they treated their employees, their suppliers, their communities, and then they. Uh, they about eight years ago they started to become an environmental company and done this. This amazing thing on the environment just is just astounding. They've made such a difference just by themselves. And there was an article that came out said it's hard to hate Walmart anymore. Yeah, well, again, it, it does show you the power of doing the right thing and uh, having the right narrative, not only in general for society, but to uh, have people want to work for you. And again, in my view, the way to do that is to have a, a branded signature story. 
you just don't get there with grants, volunteering, energy goals, and an ESG report. So uh, then the question, and maybe this begs the question, uh, how does a major corporate entity who sort of wishes to go down this path actually find that program, or if you want to call it, that sweet spot that uh, improves the, uh, or makes the world a better place, uh, creates a better environment for their employees where it gives them a sense of purpose? Because oftentimes uh, the leadership isn't necessarily attuned to, they understand what they need to do, how to get there oftentimes isn't as clear to them. Well, I think there's uh, several uh, avenues. One is you start to look at your business, the kind of offering, the kind of customer you have, the kind of assets you have, the kind of skills you have, and say, where can we do the best good? And um, uh, and so, it, it, and if you can connect it to the company in some way, so Lifeboy has done a terrific job in India and, and, and throughout Asia with help a child reach five. Turns out two million kids below the age of five die each year, mostly from water-related illnesses. And, and they developed a hand-washing program that uh, has reached a half a billion people so far. And, uh, and they've they created these, uh, these videos that describe the program in three villages. They got 44 million views. Um, and so... But, but it, it, it comes from the fact that Lifebuoy, first of all, has a heritage. They, Lifebuoy was developed over a century ago by somebody that wanted to uh, uh, deal with a, uh, the, the panic, pandemic of the day. And, uh, and, and they developed this soap that would, would help. And, uh, and so they had that heritage that's uh, hand washing the soap and and so forth. And they've already they've always had hand washing programs, but then they f- branded and, and formalized it. And uh, so anyway, that's one tact. You you ask what you're about. And uh, another is that you know you you I look inside the organization for little tiny programs that are going because somebody in your organization got a um, you know had a. a a loved one that died of cancer, or they had some something that sparked uh, and, and um, um, some some initiative, and you take that and say, well, what if we expanded that? Let's let's find five or ten of them and then expand them, and and when one of those is probably or, or not one, but maybe three or four will then get traction. So you you look at what is uh, um, what's sort of around, and. Um, you know, and it, you don't have to have something that's closely tied to your thing. I mean, look at Avon Walk for Breast Cancer, which is it uh, went for twelve years or so. It's not going right now, but um, you know that had nothing to do with Avon, but a lot to do with their main customers who were involved with with breast, breast cancer, and uh, and they got so involved in this Walk for Breast Cancer. Again, nobody accused them of being self serving. It was, you know, that it, the tension was on the walk for breast cancer and how, how well they uh, ran that program. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a company called uh, Dignity Health, which is uh, ultimately what is sort of a conglomerate made up of multiple Catholic hospitals. But uh, they did a, uh, a program, and I'm trying to think of the name of it, which I should because I actually I think it had compassion in it. But uh, they would just show videos of actually people uh, be nice in the world and uh, associated with their name and how they provide uh, health services. But it uh, was extraordinarily successful uh, and it had nothing to do directly with the brand. So I, I think uh, you're absolutely correct. Let me ask you a question. No, no, just, uh, as, I, just as an aside, I don't know Dignity Health, but uh, I would encourage them if this 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 thing worked, this video worked, is to build a whole program on that and you, with a 10-year horizon. And there's just a lot of uh, ways you can leverage that and, and scale it. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I think that's a, uh, uh, a good point. The, uh, um, it's, 
uh, what was I going to say? Uh, well, uh, I'll give you actually, in some ways, what I thought was an incredibly thoughtful move by a corporate entity, uh, but uh, they failed, at least in my opinion. And this actually has uh, to do directly with me, <laughs> actually. Uh, so uh, have you heard of Mrs. Myers? It's a organic soap type of brand. Yeah, I think I have. Yeah, so they came to me one time and they said, um, we have an idea for a marketing plan to encourage uh, children uh, to be kinder in the world. And they said, we have actually uh, developed a compassion flower. And we've created a program to give seeds to public schools to encourage children to uh, plant flowers and nurture them and promote compassion in the world. And uh, they actually did a video. And in fact, you can even find that video online at uh, Compassion Flower Mrs. Myers on YouTube. But it was an extraordinary thing. I mean, it, it, it engaged uh, thousands and thousands of children where they got these seedlings for their, at the school, they planted them, they, and they you know, uh, promoted this. And it was very, very powerful, and then it just collapsed. It just went away. And it was unfortunate because, you know, I had done a video for them with this, and it, again, it was an extraordinarily powerful video um, to the point where it made many people cry, and then it just was not followed through. And I, I was actually quite disappointed, um, uh, actually, about that. Well, if you compare that to the uh, Dove Real Beauty campaign, Dove Real Beauty, I mean, every year they look at it from an entirely different thing. So basically what they do is to do a program like you're just mentioning, but then do a separate one the next year and a, th and a third one the third year that's completely different but related to this, uh, to this idea. Another thing that strikes me is the Kind Energy Bar has a, a program where if you do an act of kindness uh, for somebody if you see an act of kindness being done, you give them a, a, a coupon, which they can uh, re get a dozen kind bars if they send it in, if they, and then they will get a coupon that they can then give somebody else. And, uh, and they've, they've uh, ascertained or demonstrated or, or, or showed that they've demonstrated, I don't know how many millions of act of kindnesses that they can document. And that's an ongoing program that that uh, just is hard to kill off. No, no, I. But this is uh, again, it shows you. I mean, I, uh, from my own work, we know that uh, kindness, compassion, empathy is uh, contagious and uh, inspires people, motivates people. And I always say, well, there are some individuals who promote negativity. And you can sometimes see this in the political environment. Uh, but the greatest motivator is actually bringing people together, being kind, and uh, being of service to others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. There, there's a, uh, uh, a brand storytelling uh, organization that sort of uh, encourage and... and uh, um, manages a, a, a system by which people make movies from three minutes to 90 minutes about some subject like kindness. And, uh, and there's some of those movies that are the same kind of thing. They, they really uh, bring about some, some, some emotion or characteristic like that. Let me ask you a question. Uh, I'm sure you, you know Unilever and Paul Pullman. W would, was he one of the first who sort of went in this direction? I mean, I, I heard a lot about him and the programs that they did. Or What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think he's my hero. He, uh, I, in my book, I have a whole chapter on, on Unilever and a whole chapter also on Salesforce. That's another good one. But Unilever is... Uh, has been without question a leader and a role model in this whole area, and uh, uh, yeah, and, and of course uh, uh, Dove is a Unilever brand as, as is Lifebuoy. These two examples I've given, and uh, and they have uh, I don't know twenty twenty six or thirty 
of their 400 brands, they've elevated to what they call a sustainable brand. And those are brands that have been done something exemplary and uh, long-term along these lines. Yeah, I uh, actually uh, worked with his wife on uh, some programs uh, actually related to kindness and compassion. And that's when I first uh, actually got interested or, or became aware of this type of uh, work that we're talking about. Do you think that uh, on some level there's a potential downside in any way for corporations uh, behaving this way? I mean, you know, there's a subset of people who would say, well, you're expending resources and, you know, if you put those resources elsewhere, it would uh, uh, give shareholders more value or you could give uh, dividends more. Is that a valid argument? I think it is. I mean, I think that, and that's 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 sort of the basis of my argument for my book. What I'm saying is that uh, directionally reduce the uh, resources you give to pure philanthropy and increase uh, the resources you give to real signature um, programs, branded signature programs, because uh, they're the ones that are going to make more impact per dollar expended, and, uh, and they're the ones that are going to help your business. And when you help your business, the argument that, uh, you know, that you are going to uh, waste money is vanishes. I mean, uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that I wrote a blog commentary on, and it said that Hellman's mayonnaise should not spend money on this uh, ma uh, make taste, not waste, this this huge program to get people that they spend a lot of money on television ads with a football player ca tackling uh, friendly gra grandmothers who was good, about to waste food. And uh, uh, which a which a program which by some estimates got four to eight billion exposures. Wow! But anyway, that the so he the the article said they shouldn't waste money on on getting people to avoid waste. They should do the fundamentals. Well, th th that's really bizarre because if you're a mayonnaise, what are you going to talk about in the second the first in the second place the main position of mayonnaise uh, from Hellman's for the last century has been to to get you to use le uh, leftovers because you can make leftovers tasty now. And so you you can make your food go longer. And so so this sort of makes that more up to date. It gives it a an environmental overlay. And uh, and so it's right in their sweet spot. And they they're, it makes them do the... Uh, the use leftovers better message uh, far better than they could do it with just telling people for the hundredth time, use leftovers, use mayonnaise. And uh, so anyway, it's the heart of their business strategy. And it's been going since uh, now for five, four or five years. And, and, and during that time, it's the heart of their business strategy. And so, uh, I mean, they, the dollars they spend on them are, are is in no way um, motivated or, or not at least uh, justified by their impact on their business. Are you there, David? I am. Oh, sorry. Could you repeat that again? I think we sort of locked up there. You were saying about the impact of uh, Hellman's um, versus sure. the justification sure. of the There cost. was an article in the Wall Street Journal that, that uh, from a finance guy that said that Hellman's is a good example of uh, spending money on, on saving f food, avoiding wasting food, when they should be geared to the fundamentals of the business. And, and I pointed out that uh, their program to make taste not waste is the fundamentals of their business. It's a, it's it is their business strategy, and it's based on part of their thousand, uh, their century old uh, heritage of being the product that helps you use leftovers, makes the leftovers taste better. Their their mayonnaise, and um, and and of course now that uh, that heritage message has been energized. 
and and add, with the addition of the environmental overlay to make it more relevant, it's done it with a humorous commercial uh, about a football player that tackles people that are about to waste food, including an elderly grandmother, and uh, uh, it, a, a, a that that uh, uh, ad and and others like it is have gotten somewhere between four and eight billion exposures. It's been estimated. So anyway, um, the argument is completely um, sort of without merit when you talk about a, an expenditure for a program that is the essence of their business strategy uh, over the four years it's existed. Let me ask you another question, uh, <clears throat> potentially in some way related. So if we look at the history of marketing and branding, uh, let's say going back a few hundred years, obviously it was um, uh, sort of very individual. Uh, the in individuals who were involved in creating the marketing pieces were not particularly sophisticated, nor were the resources available uh, to create uh, sort of powerful narratives. It was often a hit and miss. Where nowadays, as you are I'm sure well aware, Corporate entities or marketing agencies hire neuroscientists, they hire psychologists, they do immense amounts of, uh, of analysis of individuals' uh, tastes. Is, is that manipulation of the consumer uh, reasonable? And what I mean by that is, Oftentimes, marketing can actually make individuals uh, do behaviors that sometimes are not in their best interest. Well, that's a really good question. Uh, first of all, I think that, the, you know, I'm an academic researcher. And I've done a lot of experiments and so on. I, in fact, I've used physiologically, I used a, uh, 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 the... Um, the the measure that tells you how much sweat you have on your hands. Oh, or, sure, or galvanic stimulation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, uh, I think that all that research is uh, first of all, it's very modest. It it uh, it's it's going to have you know maybe improve your effectiveness ten percent or or twenty percent or something. It it's not a it's not going to make a big difference. And the fact that pe that that can it, it lead to manipulation. Is uh, you know, is really it reminds me of the the classic case where uh, there was an experiment that purported to show if you showed uh, Coca Cola in little tiny um, uh, sibits of time during the course of a commercial in a movie theater, people would buy more popcorn, and and people were just horrified. Now we're, I'm going to be manipulated by buying something. By popcorn, or something I'm not even aware of, and uh, what's next? Well, it turned out that experiment was completely discredited; it didn't exist. It, it, they couldn't do that, and yet there was this uh, this this fear. So, um, so I haven't even heard of a popcorn experiment lately that demonstrates that we can be manipulated. But I think that fear is grossly exaggerated. Uh, and I'm not going to say there's nobody around without the motivation to do that, but there's people that are around that that have the motivation to change iron into gold too, and uh, nobody's done that. And and so I think the the fear is is greatly exaggerated. Um, but yeah I, yeah, I do think though we have to worry about that. Certainly, the social. I think the, the fear is more grounded in the social media space that uh, something of that nature can be done. Well, but I, I mean, I would argue conversely that uh, marketing firms would not be in, ex in existence if it was a minimal response to any type of uh, branding because I mean, or marketing because I think fundamentally the nature of that is to manipulate people. And I'm not saying that in a negative sense, but it is to expose you to options that may not have immediately been on your mind and to embed them in your consciousness or subconsciousness. Or make them more, uh, more top of mind, more visible. 
Well, yeah. um, what I talked about, maybe these uh, these research efforts might improve things here and there, 5%, 10%, but what will prove it 400% is a big idea. And so you look at the Dove Real Beauty campaign and the Dove Self-Esteem Pack, that's a big idea. And and uh, and that will... I, that will make a difference. I mean, it has made a difference. It, it really has increased the visibility of the brand name. It's increased the, the feelings toward the brand name. It's increased the involvement with uh, associated with the brand name. And so that has, but that's a big idea. It didn't come from any uh, neural uh, research. Uh, okay. Uh- <laughs> I don't want to disparage your your. Uh... No, no, no. I, I, I'm not trying to. I'm just pointing out that uh, I think you're right. I mean, big ideas can have profound changes, and uh, but there have been subtle, um, and it's not subliminal advertising, but there have been subtle changes to how a brand may market. I believe that have been extraordinarily successful that aren't necessarily immediately intuitive. Uh, and I think, and I'm not sure if it's a direct comparison, but uh, uh, you mentioned social media, and I factually know, of course, that Facebook employs a large number of psychologists and neuroscientists to uh, create, uh, frankly, addictive behaviors that keep people showing back up. And also, I think if you look at the political environment, there is a correlation between how much money is spent on marketing uh, and uh, the success of potentially being elected. So I think it it is, can be very powerful, but I would agree with you that uh, having a big idea that paints a narrative that inspires people uh, is much more powerful. Yeah. Well, I, 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 you are absolutely right. I think that uh, the, um, the advance of the digital age has created, um, or, or I, I would say, accentuated problems we've all, always had. It's, uh, you know, there's persuasion is uh, can be used for good and, and bad, and uh, so uh, we we learn to persuade and uh, and hopefully. We are in a position where we can do that for to, for good, but it can certainly be done for bad. As you know, one of the great persuaders was Hitler, and uh, yes, uh, well, and I, I actually I don't mean to end on that point, but you're you're absolutely correct. It's it's sort of propaganda uh, with a very self serving uh, agenda versus marketing with a uh, social impact uh, motivation. And uh, so obviously those are uh, very different things. Interestingly though, uh, as we've seen with uh, Ye or Kanye West, uh, promoting uh, negative narratives uh, can be highly destructive to your brand. Yep. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, when that's the, um, one of the things we always want to be is truthful. And, uh, and a lot of times we are not truthful, not because we are trying to lie, it's because we don't understand, you know, the context in which we're making ass- assertions. And so it's a little tricky, but uh, uh, there are mechanisms to, uh, to guard against lying and falsehoods, but they're, uh, they're not only weaker than they probably should be, but also they're more challenged as, as the digital age advances. No, I think you're right. I, I think, uh, as we simply can see in the political space, but I think in other spaces as well, uh, you know, misinformation uh, uh, to the right audience can be extraordinarily powerful. And then, of course, that leads to the erosion of trust and the erosion of having faith in our uh, democratic processes even. Uh, And so, you know, I think it's been an interesting conversation in the sense of, if you will, how brands can do good for society or for the world 
while benefiting themselves, but the narrative is them actually doing something to improve the world, which again is extraordinarily powerful from all the examples you mentioned. But I think it also reminds us to understand that just as these can be extraordinarily powerful, uh, these types of branding marketing efforts can also potentially be bad in the wrong hands. Yes, for sure. Um, and then that's a, especially in a free speech democracy, that's a, uh, um, you know, a, a, a difficult road to, to walk. No, absolutely. And uh, uh, at least so far, uh, we are holding our own in this world. But uh, again, I think, uh, you know, if we look uh, as best we can through the lens of uh, altruism, empathy, compassion, uh, kindness, that, uh, uh, and make that our guiding light, then uh, we'll be in good stead. Yes, I, I, uh, I think so. And you're in the right track. I, I really admire all the stuff you've done. And, and you've turned, uh, uh, I think, everybody's thirst for that kind of a outcome. You've made it practical. You've provided some practical avenues to get there. Well, you know, it's been interesting because uh, when I first got interested in this topic, uh, there wasn't really uh, a narrative where compassion at least was generally used or these types of terms. And I think for a lot of people, they perceive them as sort of soft or not able to validate scientifically the value proposition. But I think over the last decade and a half or two, uh, it has completely re reversed, and and not only in general society, but in fact, in some ways, about what we're talking about, which is having a positive impact on corporate entities, uh, and sort of uh, getting away from this narrative of ruthless capitalism, but more, and I hate to say, uh, uh, conscious capitalism or compassionate capitalism, since that has uh, not necessarily <laughs> been used correctly. But I think uh, it is ha it is ha it is and has an effect in those environments. Well, thank you so much for spending a little bit of your time today with me. I, I think it was a uh, a far-reaching conversation on different aspects, and uh, uh, I think a purpose-driven, values-driven branding, uh, I think, uh, hopefully, will be embraced by more corporate entities and will have an ever-increasing effect on uh, our society in a very positive way. Well, thanks, James. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor to be on. Well, thank you again, and I hope we stay in touch. And as I said, uh, your daughter's a very special person, and I've uh, appreciated all the time I've been able to spend with her. Oh, she is, for sure. Take care. Okay, thank you. Again, thank you for being with us today. The Into the Magic Shop podcast can be found where you find your most popular podcasts, or you can find us at intothemagicshop.com. <laughs>